welcome to another episode of Don't Call It Small. I'm your host, Natasha Foreman. If you don't know me and you have no clue what this podcast is all about, let me share a bit. I'm the CEO of Foreman Associates, LLC, where we provide consulting, business support, and professional development services. And Don't Call It Small is where we talk all things business, share tips and news that you can use, and highlight the people and ideas behind the products and services that we buy. To learn more about our team, please visit Foreman LLC. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Oh my goodness, another week, another episode of sharing all things business. Before we jump in to uh, this topic for the day, I want to give some shout outs. Yes, I have four special women that I'd like to shout out that, um, one of which you've, you've, I've, sh- I've shouted out plenty of times and I've, um, uh, even interviewed. So if you, if you haven't linked up with my friend, Billy Harris yet, the powerhouse behind the Vino Van LLC, then it better be for only one of two reasons. One, you don't live in or near the state of Georgia and you won't be visiting or two, you're allergic to wine. So you can't drink it. That's it. Those are the only two acceptable reasons for not contacting Billy, scheduling a wine tour, or wine tasting. Period. And yes, I'm emphasizing the T at the end that we started adding about, uh, what, two years ago. (laughs) I've shared Billy with all of you in episodes 6, 7, 14, 18, and 19, and then I interviewed her in episode 23. So I'm sharing some of her awesomeness again today. If you're in Atlanta or you'll be in Atlanta on Sunday, March 29th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., you, my friends, can purchase tickets to the Vino Van LLC's Spring Wine Tasting Series. It's the Women Winemakers. Yes, at that event, you will taste wines from around the world made by amazing women winemakers. Uh, Yeah, from California, Australia, and all other countries around the world. It's a wine pop-up that you don't want to miss. Tickets are available now on Eventbrite. Grab your age 21 and over girls and your age 21 and over guys and join the Vino Van for a night of extraordinary wines, food, and plenty of fun. I will, of course, share the direct link on our blog and in the overview section of this podcast. If you have any questions about the event, you can email the Vino Van at Outlook.com. Please also feel free to visit thevinovan.com to book your wine tour or other event today. Their events sell out super fast, so please don't sleep on the Women Winemakers event, Sunday, March 29th. Cheers! Now, the next person that I would like to shout out is my cousin, Princess Peoples, who is blending her eclectic and eccentric inner workings into a creative brand that she named Style Eccentric Souls. She's based in Boston, Massachusetts, where she makes custom accessories such as earrings, purses, and more. And I just have to tell you about some of her custom purses. She has custom-made basketball purses made out of actual basketballs. Like, seriously. She has custom clock purses that are literally made out of clocks, and they work. The clocks work, people. Imagine seeing someone walking down the street and you can see the hands of the clock just tick, tick, ticking away. She only has one more basketball purse left and I can guarantee you that you won't see that same purse anywhere. So if it's gone, you better beg her (laughs) to custom make one for you. She's also designing other sports inspired purses that you can find soon on her Etsy store. My cousin Princess has a YouTube channel where she walks you through her um, DIY projects, such as her knee-high Converse that she put her own creative twist on. She's also working on these clear platform heels that will make you squeal with absolute giddiness and delight when you realize what's in the shoe. Oh gosh, I don't want to spoil the fun. You have to see for yourself. You can find her on Etsy, Instagram, and Facebook at Style Eccentric Souls. S-O-U-L-S. 
Tell her you heard about her and her eccentric creations on the Don't Call It Small business podcast. Now, I have another cousin that I'd like to share with you, Pepsi Caligone out of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, who I mentioned before. She has a children's book that is too adorable. It's called The 21 Second Hug, which was published in 2018. Did you know that it has been scientifically proven that hugging for at least 20 seconds can significantly improve your mood and well-being? Yep. Well, in the 21 second hug, you and the special child or children in your life can read about a family of rabbits and one bunny in particular who asks mommy about the hugs she gives. And you can read all about what she has to say to her baby bunny. You can purchase the 21 second hug on Amazon. Pepsi has another children's book coming soon called The Adventures of Phoebe and Philip. Join these two on their journey to Titanium Falls. Along the way, they meet some amazing new friends. Visit Pepsi's website so you can stay in the loop on what's coming soon and possibly on future events where you can meet her and ask her, you know, to sign your 21 second hug book. Visit her website at pepsicaligone.com. So that's P-E-P-S-I-C-A-L-I-G-O-N-E.com. And of course, I'll have all of the details on our blog and the podcast overview. The next woman that I'd like to shout out is Jaren Turner. She lives here in Atlanta. We met a few weeks ago through our mutual friend, Wanda Roberts, and we found out that we had some things in common, such as we both have extensive backgrounds as consultants, and we both have MBAs with marketing concentrations, and we're both into restorative yoga. Jaren, a Spelman College and Clark Atlanta University graduate, is an executive almost 12 years at City. It didn't take long before I was intrigued by her. We talked about the benefits of being gluten-free. She's been gluten-free for years and oh my goodness. And then we talked about how my backsliding has caused me so much pain and agony because I can't resist the gluten-based products. Oh my gosh. But I know how much better I feel when I'm not eating gluten. Then... When I found out that she is a published author, I just knew I was going to highlight her, her career, her work on this podcast. I always look for multiple ways to highlight people and multiple opportunities to interview them. And guess what? I found that in Jaren. So expect to hear an interview with her in the upcoming months. On her website, um, J-E-R-Y-N Turner, T-U-R-N-E-R.com. She states that she writes because it's the vessel she uses to express her vulnerability. Writing is how she makes sense of the myriad of images, thoughts, dreams, and beliefs swirling around in her mind. Now let me tell you about her books and where to find them. The first book that I'd like to share is called A Dream Come True. It dives into the deep aspects of one of the most important relationships a woman can have, the one with her mother. The setting of the book is Peru, a mecca of spirituality, and it involves a time traveler experience. The strong spirit of women is presented in this book and portrays a sacred bond and strength that exists when they come together. On their trip to Peru, a mother and daughter take an excursion to the Sacred Valley while they've had an honest conversation about their lives. By opening up emotionally, they create a deeper level of trust and commitment. Now, this book is fiction, um, but it summarizes the true dynamics present in many relationships. It's full of timeless advice and is presented in a way that daughters are open to receive since it's written from a daughter's point of view. This book is a must-read for all, but especially those who are seeking to deepen the connections with the important women in their lives. You can purchase A Dream Come True on Amazon in paperback and Kindle formats, and be sure to leave stars in a review on Amazon for her. Her newest book is titled The Biggest Star, which is a book written to help, for, um, to help children deal with their loss. The story is told from the perspective of the departed, and it walks through common questions and emotions felt by children. Poetry helps to keep an, a child's attention and uses a lighter approach to explain a tough subject. And when we look at grief, it's extremely difficult, especially for children. So the message of this book is to provide support during a time that can be incomprehensible. The Biggest Star provides suggestions for how to cope as well as things they can do to keep the memory of their loved ones alive. When I heard about this, I teared up because, you know, I think of... Um, my experiences when loved ones parted when I was young, but also, you know, as adult, there's certain things that you just can't comprehend. And to be able to provide that kind of resource for children is just, it's just, it's invaluable. It's just priceless. 
So you can purchase the book at Higgins Publishing. It's available in hardcover, paperback, and ebook. She also has the Biggest Star Sherpa Blanket. Yeah, it's available in two sizes, and there's a fluffy pillow that you can add to the mix, all of which is a perfect combination for book reading. Once again, visit her website at J-E-R-Y-N-T-U-R-N-E-R.com and, of course, HigginsPublishing.com. On our blog and in our podcast overview, I'll provide direct links to her website, Amazon store and the Higgins publishing storefront. I wish the best to all four women as they do their part to share and pour into others. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so very much. Alrighty then. Shout out time is over. Let's roll up our sleeves and strut ourselves into today's topic. We're looking at depression, the state of lack, and how it all can take its toll on you and yes, your family. I have a quote, well, and also your business. Um, I have a quote that will help to frame and shape today's conversation. It's from Michael Beckwith. He said that there's a lie that acts like a virus within the mind of humanity. And that lie is there's not enough good to go around. There's lack and there's limitation and there's just not enough. The truth is that there's more than enough good to go around. There are more than enough creative ideas. There is more than enough power. There is more than enough love. There is more than enough joy. All of this begins to come through a mind that is aware of its own infinite nature. There is enough for everyone. If you believe it, if you can see it, if you act from it, it will show up for you. That's the truth. Wow. That is just reading that again, just really just touches my core. It just flows through me, right? There is enough. It's interesting. I came up with today's topic, but couldn't recall what drove me to initially jot down the title months ago. And in doing my research, I can recall asking myself, exactly do I want to say? What am I trying to make clear to the audience? What will the takeaway be? Every episode I try to share more or differently than what you typically gather through your super fast Jetson's life, right? Everyone's zooming through here and I want to be able to impart some words, impart some sentiments that can have some stickability. And I think of the various listeners and consider what each person is experiencing, feeling and thinking, not just in your daily lives, but in the moments that you invest the time to tune in and listen to me for 30 minutes to a little over an hour. Is the content impactful? Is it shareable? I ponder all of this each week. So this week was no different. I actually stared at my computer much longer than normal, making sure that this wouldn't be a wasted episode and a waste of your time. Hopefully it hasn't been so far. And hopefully when you reach the end, you find it rewarding and worth sharing with others. If you recall from episode 13, I discussed relationships and I briefly touched on mental health, even sharing with you two men that I personally know in the mental health profession, doctors Jack Daniels and Aldewan Tart, both here in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Daniels is a psychotherapist and Dr. Tart is a psychologist. And you can only imagine how many people that they listen to and speak with who are struggling with a litany of issues, but thankfully they've taken the steps by first asking for help. Think of the millions of us who choose to walk around instead in silence and misery. Not speaking about the things that haunt us will eventually eat us up from the inside out. That then leads me to recall episode 15, where I share 20 reasons why businesses fail. I think it was 20 reasons. I mean, anyway, let me not go down that rabbit hole of wonder. (laughs) I shared all of the trappings in episode 15 that... Um, so many of us get caught up in some tied to fear, others to pride. And then there's the ignorance, the not knowing what we don't know. There's the overdoing it that leads to burnout. So in episode 17, I shared the ways that we can support entrepreneurs. And by looking at our skills, strengths, resources, facing and possibly overcoming fears, legally protecting our ideas and asking for help from our team members, co-founders, advisors, coaches, and therapists. A lot of people don't want to admit that they suffer from envy, jealousy, or FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. Ugh. The fear of missing out causes a lot of people to focus on what they perceive that they don't have or aren't part of versus being content with what they do have or where they currently are. 
We try to be humorous about it using memes and things, but we really need to address the complexities and dangers of feeling as though we are deprived, lacking, left behind, or left out. We don't realize how this plays out and how it bleeds into other areas of our life. When approached from a different way, we would call it operating out of lack. It's also a large branch of the scarcity tree that many people get clobbered by. Stephen R. Covey, the author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, wrote that most people are deeply scripted in what I call the scarcity mentality. They see life as having only so much, as though there were only one pie out there. And if someone were to get a big piece of the pie, it would mean less for everybody else. The scarcity mentality is the zero-sum paradigm of life. People with a scarcity mentality have a very difficult time sharing recognition and credit, power or profit, even with those who help in the production. They also have a hard time being genuinely happy for the success of other people. This, my friends, (laughs) is what so many people would call having haters. Haters are the people who have a hard time being happy for other people's success, right? They have a hard time being happy for other people's joy, accomplishments, and blessings. That's because they're operating out of lack, out of scarcity, thinking that someone has something that there was already not enough of. And now, oh, now there's one less man, woman, dress, job, award, or thing to get because Darn them for getting that one. We also see this in the workplace with job promotions. Haters. We see managers who fear having their team members promoted over them, so they try desperately to keep them at a level below them. We see employees who fear having to share profit, power, or any piece of the economic pie because with scarcity, they fear there won't be enough for them. No matter how many times someone says, there's enough. It reminds me of kids. The birthday cake or pizza is put out there and there's always one or two children, usually one who triggers a second one, who act as though somehow the adult miscounted, miscalculated, and they will be the only child without a slice of cake or pizza. In their minds, there won't be enough. And sadly, they start pushing, shoving, tripping, and acting a complete fool to try to be the first one with a slice. Even though the adult said repeatedly, there is enough for everyone. No pushing, Jimmy. The fact is, Jimmy's operating out of lack. Scarcity is flowing through his veins. Obviously, Jimmy has experienced being the one holding the short end of the stick and missing out, or he's been told at one point in his life that it's a possibility. So Jimmy is determined to never let that happen again or at all. Without intervention, repeated intervention and realignment, Jimmy will grow up to be the jerk we all want to punch repeatedly in the face. Please, people, help Jimmy, please. (laughs) Now, Stephen R. Covey also wrote that, quote, people with scarcity mentality tend to see everything in terms of win-lose. There's only so much, you know, if someone else has it, that means there's less for me. The more principle-centered we become, the more we develop an abundance mentality, the more we are genuinely happy for the successes, well-being, achievements, recognition, and good fortune of other people. We believe their success adds to rather than detracts from our lives. I look at it this way. In life, school, and work, we can share countless scenarios that lead to our stress, fear, frustration, and depression. The root cause is lack. There is a perceived or actual lack of time, money, resources, self-confidence, etc. We begin to obsess over it. It rules us day and night, awake and asleep. John C. Maxwell wrote an article on March 4th, 2015 for success.com where he said that, quote, when I speak to audiences across the country, I often hear about the challenges people face in the workplace. 
More often than not, these difficulties stem from a scarcity mindset, end quote. When we consider depression, it's wrong to just wrap it up and call it sadness. There are so many variables that make up that buffet or burrito of existence. And I apologize. Sorry for the food reference, but that's what just came to me. Some people describe a numbness, a dullness, helplessness, an inescapable fog that hangs over and shrouds you, a tiredness that has nothing to do with sleepiness. And then I found this quote on Sitecom that says, what is depression like? And the answer that was given was, it's like drowning, except everyone around you is breathing. Sherry Amatenstein, I've butchered her name, is a licensed clinical social worker. And she describes that Um, She describes this as, quote, the waves of pencil-like pain keep pummeling your brain as your body is dragged down, down, down onto the inky cold depths of the ocean floor, choking you. The question, stay fetal-like or fight your way to the surface, end quote. Friends, Sadly, thousands of people succumb to the drowning feeling and making the choice to not fight their way to the surface. The hope is gone and there's no more fight left. And that is why we need more resources and more healthy environments for people to turn to without feelings of shame and embarrassment. We ignorantly assume that only weak or defective people get depressed. Um, anyone with a heart, brain, and feelings get depressed. Hello? Some people just wrongly call it something else. Like, I'm just going through something. Uh, (laughs) yeah, something that's been consuming you for weeks and months. But you don't want to call it what it is so you can get the help that you need. And if you don't have a support system at home, there's no added motivation to get help. So you suffer in silence. I mentioned plenty of times on this podcast in, and also in my NatashaForeman.com blog about my battles with depression, stress, anxiety, and other nasty culprits that want to rain hell in my life. (laughs) Oh, some days I give them the finger and some days they give me the finger. (laughs) It's on the days that I'm convinced of lack or void in my life that these culprits get the best of me. That's when I can get dragged into the comparison trap. Whether I'm comparing my current life to old lives I once lived, and I'm not talking about like, you know, reincarnation. I'm just talking about the past, right? And the chapters that are closed that I now compare my current chapter to. You know, sometimes I'm comparing my 20-something self to now my 40-something self. Comparing my weight five years ago or 10 years ago to now. Or if I begin comparing myself to other people, ugh, people that I know or that I see on television or social media, geez, that is a deadly trap. All of it is. It just drains you of every drop of energy you have. And it's worthless. It's absolutely useless. The more you compare, the less grateful you are for what you have, where you are. Anthony Robbins said that, quote, when you're grateful, fear disappears and abundance appears, end quote. Back to Stephen R. Covey. He speaks in great detail about the abundance mentality. I mentioned his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And in that book, he wrote that the abundance mentality flows out of a deep inner sense of personal worth and security It's the paradigm that there's plenty out there and enough to spare for everybody. And it results in sharing of prestige, of recognition, of profits, of decision-making. It opens possibilities, options, alternatives, and creativity. We've seen in business, through managers, even owners of companies, who want to be the only superstar. 
the only smart person, the only one shining and thriving. And if they aren't, then they will sabotage the efforts of team members to the point of sabotaging their own company. I was talking about that yesterday with someone who shared about how a business colleague that he worked with years ago would undermine him behind his back, crack jokes about him to the audience after he left the stage from speaking about a topic for their business. And the colleague was called out for it by another team member after the person heard the nonsense three times too many. But it didn't stop there. Since this colleague was the founder of the organization, He basically would poo-poo on any idea that wasn't his own or that he couldn't easily turn into his own or take credit for. So they missed out on huge opportunities because his ego pride and scarcity mindset. He simply wasn't open to possibilities, options, alternatives, and creativity. He couldn't share in the prestige, recognition, decision-making, all of which would have led to greater profits, greater impact, And the organization would still be around. Uh, yeah. We can't try to pretend that depression and other culprits aren't life snatchers. It just is senseless to do. So we have to sit back and really, really think, really think. In 2009, the CFO of Freddie Mac, David Kellerman, hanged himself. In 2016, a student in the U.S. by the name of Caitlin Nicole Davis hanged herself because she could no longer take the pressures from being abused, bullied, and depressed. In 2018, actress Margot Kidder, who was best known as Lois Lane in Superman, died of a drug and alcohol overdose. Entrepreneur and designer Kate Spade took her life. Chef and TV personality Anthony Bourdain also took his life. In 2019, we heard about two South Korean K-pop singers and actresses, Gu Ha-ra and Choi Jun-ri, who both committed suicide after being cyberbullied. And let's go backwards. In 2002, J. Clifford Baxter, an executive from Enron Corporation, killed himself. In 2012, the genius behind the televised dance and music franchise, Soul Train, Mr. Don Cornelius, died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. It was reported that he had been suffering from seizures. If you don't know about Soul Train, let me share some Soul Train with you. Soul Train laid the groundwork for future shows like So You Think You Can Dance and America's Best Dance Crew. I grew up watching Soul Train and wanting to be on Soul Train and actually going to Soul Train as a music executive and seeing all the behind the scenes. Twenty fourteen, a Filipina model by the name of Helena Belmonte jumped off a building. Malik Benjul Benjalul a Swedish documentary filmmaker who struggled with depression jumped in front of a moving train. The Japanese psychiatrist Atsumi Yoshikubo intentionally got lost in the Canadian Taiga. An Australian TV presenter, Charlotte Dawson, was found dead from, by hanging due to cyberbullying. It's become the norm to hear and read news updates about various celebrities and everyday people battling personal demons and trying to use drugs and alcohol to cope, not realizing that there's demons in those things too. And in overdosing, they they too lost their lives and lost the battle. Someone listening to me right now may be thinking that drugs and alcohol or other vices are the solution to numb an already numbing situation. I could go on and on about the various people that committed suicide, overdosed from 2000 to 2020, but I won't. What I will say on this is there's a psychological price that comes with creativity, fame, success, and popularity or the desire to achieve those things. There's also great risk for those of you who want to be or currently are entrepreneurs. I read an article from Jessica Bruder published in Inc.com titled, The Psychological Price of Entrepreneurship. 
where she mentions how our culture props successful entrepreneurs on the pedestal of heroes and we begin to idolize them. We celebrate fast growth companies. But unbeknownst to most of us, a lot of those entrepreneurs have secret demons that they struggled with and struggle with still. And before reaching this pinnacle of success, some of them had extreme anxiety and depression and they couldn't say anything because admitting these things were taboo. Everyone was and still are faking it until they make it. The sad truth is that not everyone makes it. Looking back over the long list of names that I mentioned and considering the many more names that I didn't, you would think that Those who were successful in their careers would be least likely to commit suicide or flood their bodies with drugs and alcohol. Yet, look at their cause of death. They weren't dying of old age or some other um, natural cause. When we look at business startups, we oftentimes overlook the grueling and dang near sadistic experiences that one must endure to successfully launch and manage an idea. And keep driving and pushing it farther and upward. Years ago, two startup founders committed suicide two years apart. 47-year-old Jody Sherman, the founder of e-commerce site Econom, and Ilya Zittermiski, the 22-year-old co-founder of social networking site Diaspora. These two suicides caused the startup community to really start discussing entrepreneurship and mental health, the tie in the the relationship between. Because when companies fail, we should never think that the founders, CEOs, and other executives are just hunky-dory about the situation. Hey, it's not a big thing. Hey, okay. No. Many people are clobbered by internal demons because in their failing, they can feel like failures. In their failing, there's a sense of lack. There is a void. And if they are well-known entrepreneurs and executives, it can feel like public shame. They don't want to be seen by the public as losers. With news outlets and social media sites being the platform for shaming, bullying, and judgment, this can be an unbearable experience especially for those with the toughest of emotional skin, yeah, they too can break. They can tear. They can fall apart. Entrepreneurship comes with an extremely high risk of failure. Three out of four venture-backed startups fail. So imagine how many shoestring budget startups fail. Shikhar Ghosh A Harvard Business School lecturer is quoted as saying that more than 95% of startups fall short of their intentional projections. Not fall short a little bit. They fall short a lot of it. Michael A. Freeman, a psychiatrist and former entrepreneur who's researching mental health and entrepreneurship, said that, quote, you can get into a startup mode where you push yourself and abuse your body and that can trigger mood vulnerability, end quote. That made me think. Many new and even seasoned entrepreneurs can complicate matters by neglecting their health. Heck, I mean, I'm guilty of this more than a handful of times. I've I've risked my health more than I can count. We can eat too much or not enough, don't get enough sleep, fail to exercise enough or at all. I mean, last night I was up working. I told myself I was going to go to bed at a reasonable hour. I was I FaceTimed with my, my sister, my mom, and my nephew. And then my sister and I stayed on on there up until it was like 11 something. And I'm telling myself I'm going to go to bed, you know, at midnight, one at the latest. I didn't go to bed till 6 a.m. today. That is a breeding ground for stress and depression to come kicking in your mind like Kung Fu Panda. (laughs) It really is. I've used the Kung Fu Panda reference before. I love Kung Fu Panda. He's hilarious. So (laughs) you add to all of that, and I'm not making light of this. I'm just, I need you to laugh so that you don't cry, right? So taking all of this into consideration, there's so much that, People don't realize 
um, that we are subjecting ourselves to time and time again. And the thing is, is that we have to really sit back and say, why? And is enough enough? And when is enough enough? Right? Add to that having to juggle many roles, face setbacks, disputes, staffing problems, financial problems, trying to make payroll. Dr. Freeman said that, quote, there are traumatic events all the way along the line, end quote. We only look at the anxiety, stress, and depression of our employees. I mean, if you look at all of the different articles that we talk about, we're always talking about our employees. And that's a great thing. We should. And more people should. Because some people don't even care about their employees. As long as the work is done, they can have a, the highest turnover rate on the planet. But at the same token, we're also overlooking the same in entrepreneurs. According to the Gallup Healthways Wellbeing Index, entrepreneurs experience more anxiety than their employees. But researchers also believe that it's more than having a stressful job that pushes people over the edge. When you look at the shared innate character traits, you can see that entrepreneurs are more vulnerable to mood swings. Now, some of you may laugh or smirk because you're thinking of a current or previous boss who acts like an emotional roller coaster. Or maybe that person is you. Dr. Freeman said that people who are on the energetic, motivated, and creative side are both more likely to be entrepreneurial and more likely to have strong emotional states. Those states, he explained, can include suicidal thinking, depression, loss of motivation, worthlessness, hopelessness, and despair. The very passion that drives an entrepreneur can evolve into an obsession that can grow very dark and heavy very fast. This can lead to what researchers at Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne, Australia see as, quote, impaired functioning. Because as distress and anxiety begin to consume them, your functions become impaired. Go a step farther in the wrong direction. And that's where you will find yourself in a state of what's called hypomania. This is what John Hopkins University Medical School psychologist Dr. John Gartner argues is an overlooked temperament that may be responsible for some entrepreneurs' strengths and their flaws. It's a rung or two, I guess, on the ladder below uh, that of mania. And it often occurs in the relatives of people that are manic depressives, affecting roughly 5 to 10 percent of Americans. Dr. Gartner explained it like this. If you're a manic, you think you're Jesus. If you're hypomanic, you think you're God's gift to technology investing. Different levels of grandiosity, but the same symptoms. Although driven and innovative, hypomanics are at much higher risk for depression and much more higher than the general population. Dr. Gardner explained this and the fact that failure can spark these episodes of depression, but so can anything that slows down a hypomanic's momentum. Because hypomanics need to be busy, active, overworking. If you try to slow them down, keep them inside, lock them up, they will flip their lid the founder of management consulting firm Pinnacle Strategies is Mark Wopel. He launched his firm in 1992 and by 2009, his business was falling flat and fast. He was in the tornado that we call the global financial crisis. His sales plummeted 75% and he had to lay off his employees. He exhausted his assets, sold jewelry, cars, anything else he could liquidate. And with that, guess what else started crashing and burning? His confidence, his self-esteem, his self-worth, his value. He went from abundance to lack real fast. He's quoted as saying, 
As CEO, you have this self-image. You're the master of the universe. Then all of a sudden, you're not. End quote. So what did he do? He isolated himself. He didn't leave home. He started powering back unhealthy food and packing on the pounds. An extra 50 pounds to be exact. He didn't stop trying to work on developing new services for his business. Thank goodness for him. I mean, he did pick up an addiction to uh, playing the guitar all day long. But he did also make sure that he worked on developing new services. He just wasn't sure if those ideas, uh, you know, could the company hold on long enough for him to sell them? Or would it flatline and die? Well, in 2010, thankfully, customers started to return and his company landed their biggest ever contract with an aerospace manufacturer. And that so is because of a white paper that he had written during his low valley experience. The clobbering he and his company took made him more resilient and tempered. It also gave him a reality check about what was most important and what was actually sustaining him. He had said that in the past, he used to always say, my work is me. But then in his failure, he realized that your kids still love you, your wife still loves you, your dog still loves you, and that was what lifted him up. That was the uplift for him. That points me to a Brene Brown quote. Quote, for me, the opposite of scarcity is not abundance. It's enough. I'm enough. My kids are enough. End quote. But not everyone sees and embraces that grace. Not everyone comes home to a wife that's loving Consider it kind. Not everyone is like uh, Monica Alsobrook, who remember I in, I interviewed Monica and her husband Antoine a few episodes ago, and remember just Monica sharing her story and how she stood by and continues standing by her husband through ups and downs, through being homeless twice, through losing all of their worldly possessions. So some people see their reality of what they don't have and there comes lack. They don't see and embrace the other graces that may be there. And another reality is is that not everyone's battle wounds fully heal. Some people are so traumatized by their experiences that they become hypersensitive and emotionally reactive to even the smallest of things. It's the triggering that causes some people to step down and away from their businesses, jobs, etc. Even their relationships, right? Maybe it has to do with a misunderstanding of abundance. Wayne Dyer said, and this, I love this quote. He said that abundance is not something we acquire. It is something we tune into. He's also known for saying, doing what you love is the cornerstone of having abundance in your life. There is an article in 2018 from Chris Myers. It's, um, you can find it on Forbes.com where he said that entrepreneurs are quote, if are, if nothing else, creators, They strive on the unknown and live to create something out of nothing. With that drive, however, comes an increased risk of depression and mental illness. He went on to say that people who have ambition, vision, and big dreams tend to suffer, excuse me, from what uh, author Nasir Gaimi calls a first rate madness, where battles with personal demons offset the genius within us. I have another quote from John Maxwell. I'm just full of quotes today, right? Um, Where he said, the leaders who allow a scarcity mindset to work its way into their culture pay a high price when resources such as money, opportunity, recognition are perceived to be limited. Paranoia, fear, and politics thrive. And this, I, that just hit me. Because this isn't just in business. This is also in our neighborhoods, towns, cities, states, and countries. And I wrote a blog post on NatashaForman.com the other day where I declared that we're living in a grapes of wrath era. If you don't know the book, you didn't read the book, you didn't see the 1960s movie about the book, you need to. Because in the grapes of wrath era, 
This is where leaders are cultivating scarcity. And in doing so, paranoia and fear takes over. And as Maxwell wrote, politics then thrives. And boy, oh boy, (laughs) isn't politics thriving nowadays? In the workplace, teamwork and innovation suffers in a scarcity ecosystem. To change that, leaders have to speak and demonstrate their appreciation for team members. We do more and work harder when we feel appreciated and cared for. It's as simple as that. So what are some suggestions for getting out of the scarcity mentality trap? Stephen Covey says that we must remind ourselves that there's more than enough. He says that we have to repeat over and over until we get it, that there is plenty for everyone. There is plenty for everyone. There is plenty for everyone. You have to remind yourself to not be pushy Jimmy, thinking he won't get a slice of cake or pizza. Jimmy, there's plenty for everyone. When your scarcity is tied to jealousy over what others have that you don't, or you think that you don't, you have to stop thinking for a moment and ask yourself how that other person's blessing is preventing you from being blessed. Ask yourself how someone else getting a raise will block you from getting one. Just because someone else is getting married, having a baby, taking a vacation, falling in love, How in the world does that block you from receiving blessings of your own? If you're truly honest with yourself, you will admit that it doesn't. You will admit that you've been hoodwinked and made to look like a fool by the scarcity demon. You're walking around drinking a big old carton of haterade. You need to stop and go sit down in time out. Go get in that corner just for a little while. Breathe. Woosaw. Something else you need to do is focus on your personal growth. Focus on activities and things that build your skills, bring you joy and happiness. When you're only consuming your time with mindless junk, all you will ultimately see is lack. You will see and feel nothing but junk. You also may need new relationships. There's a bunch of sayings I can quote. I'm just going to stick to two. Birds of a feather flock together. And if you hang around nine broke people, then you're probably the 10th person. Now, that last quote, my ex-husband, John Hope Ryan, always says, I don't know if it's his or if it's someone else's, so I'll cover my bases and give him credit for it. (laughs) There's truth in both of these quotes. It's rare to see a nagging, negative, cynical person who hangs around a bunch of positive, cheery, joyful, optimistic people. Nope. Nags, cynics, and negative people like to stick together like pests. Mindsets like viruses are contagious. If you've outgrown, um, or excuse me, not outgrown, but if you've grown to have a funky mood and attitude, then you're probably associating with people who think, act, and behave the same way you do. You need to purge. And oh goodness, I don't mean like the movie. Please, please don't do that kind of purging. No, no. I mean, start filtering out associates and friends. Start wiggling your way out of these ongoing relationships and interactions. Start meeting new people, going to places that you normally would avoid. Start volunteering with different organizations and groups. Go to the park, take an outdoor um, activities. Um, stimulate your mind in positive environments and with positive people. You will find yourself breaking free of the traps that have been enslaving you. Some other things you can do is choose to see opportunities instead of problems. I've mentioned that before in several episodes. Another door closed in your face. Can you see the opportunities elsewhere? Great. Then go elsewhere. Stop hanging around that closed door feeling sorry for yourself and beating yourself up because someone didn't want what you were offering. Move on to someone else. Move on to something else. That's their loss, not yours. You will meet another person who will see the value of what you're delivering and will quickly sign up, whether it's for a product or service you're selling, whether it's a relationship of friendship, of, you know, companionship, of loveship, of, of, you know, a situationship. There's someone else out there. There's more than enough people. There really are. Take the time to reflect and be grateful for what you do have. I can guarantee you, that you will lose count of your blessings. Try it. Right now, just start counting your blessings. Well, don't do it right now because, you know, I don't know if you can split your mind into 
listening to me and counting your blessings. But when you have a moment, start counting your blessings. I mean, really try it. Count every small, often overlooked blessing. Count the blessings that you take for granted, like breathing, blinking eyes, working tear ducts, taste buds, finger and toenails. I mean, you can go on and on and on and on and on. And I can guarantee you that you won't count every blessing. Sorry, I had to take a sip of water. (laughs) That's what happens when you work all night. All of a sudden, you start trying to yap, yap, yap. The next day, a throat starts going out. <laughs> but hey, there's a blessing in that, right? I've been blessed with this water. There's blessings that you don't even realize, such as the car that made you miss the stoplight. And it had you just, oh, you're just so ticked off, right? But had you made it through the light, you would have been in the car accident a block ahead. But you you don't consider that. Instead, you just fuss and cuss about a blessing that you didn't even realize. You are a fool. A dat gum fool. (laughs) Yes, you are. There's an interview with a psychologist. I can't think of his name right now. And I meant to write it down. Um, But he pointed out something that I'm sure most of us never considered. You know, when people go on and on about the one percenters and how repulsive they are, you know what? Just give me a second. I'm going to, oh, well, no, I'll just try to find it and share it on the blog. I was going to try to pause for a moment, go find his name so I can give him credit, but I'll, I'll give him credit on the blog. So go to my, the blog after you're done listening to this and you'll see his name. But he said in the interview, um, how, you know, people go on and on about the one percenters and how repulsive they are. And then he said, you know, who actually are, who's exactly the one percent? And he says, because if you actually calculate who makes up the 1% globally, it's basically everyone who makes roughly over $33,000 a year. Yeah, not just who makes up the 1% in your country. Who makes up the 1% globally is roughly 33000 a year. So um, that's a whole lot of people in the United States alone. That means that There are a lot of people walking around bad-mouthing the 1% and they too are the 1%. (laughs) What irony. Like, I get it when you're talking about the 1% of your country and you're at the very bottom of that. But when you look at a global perspective, if you look at yourself in that world perspective, you are the 1% for the most part. Now, there are some people that fall below that number. But for those of you that don't, check yourself. He went on to say, which makes perfect sense, is that the 1% in the minds of the masses is everyone who has more money than you. You're upset at someone because they have more than you. That, my friends, is a scarcity mindset. That's operating out of lack. And what's even funnier is that in all of that cussing and fussing, if you have the opportunity to earn with those who make more than you earn, You wouldn't blink or hesitate in saying, sign me up. And you could just direct deposit that check into my account. That leads me to another quote. A Wayne uh, Wayne Dyer quote that just really boxes us up nicely with a big bow. He said, everything you're currently against blocks you from abundance. I'm going to say that again. Everything you're currently against blocks you from abundance. I'm going to let that marinate all in you, just flow all through you. Sean Percival, a former MySpace vice president, the co-founder of the children's clothing startup Whittleby, which is now defunct, it's no longer. He wrote an article a while ago, years ago, called When It's Not All Good, Ask for Help. He published this on his website. He said, I was to the edge and back a few times this past year with my business and own depression. If you're about to lose it, please contact me. And he urged and still urges distressed entrepreneurs to seek professional help. And if you're feeling suicidal, please call the National Suicide Prevention Line at 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. There's no shame. There's no judgment. There's no disgrace. You're not weak. 
You're not less than. You're not alone. Just want you to know that. It's hard out here for all of us. So with that, you guys know what this is. It's that time again. Time to wrap up and go our separate ways until next week. If you have questions or suggestions about this show, please email them to don't call it small biz with a Z at gmail.com. One last quote for you. Hopefully you're not quoted out. It's from William James. William James said, the greatest discovery of my generation is that a human being can alter his life by altering his attitudes of mind. And I can't help but to piggyback that one with a John Maxwell quote. Ah, one more quote. And he said, let your mindset be your biggest asset. With that, be sure to check us out on Instagram and Facebook at Foreman and, oh no, wait a minute. On Facebook, we're at Foreman and Associates. On Twitter and Instagram, we're at Foreman LLC. That's um, our show, our Don't Call It Small podcast we have on Twitter. Our handle is It Ain't Small. Be sure to also follow us and share us with your friends, colleagues, and family. Um, you can also check me out. Follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Natasha L. Foreman. Reach out to me. Say hello. Share your story. I look forward to meeting you. And don't forget... Um, oh, wait, before I do, um, I want to give proper credit to our show theme song. This song that you're jamming to right now is called Higher Up. It's by Shane Ivers. Thank you for tuning in to the Don't Call a Small Business Podcast, for sharing this with others, and for your continued support. Don't forget what I tell you on each and every episode. Um, don't call what you're planning, thinking, dreaming, or doing, little or small. Go big, go bold, or go nowhere. I'll see you all next week. Have a super awesome day and week.